Welcome to the Thinking Hard About Pain, Psychological Challenges and Recovery in Chronic Pain webinar. We're glad you're here with us today. My name is Tanya Hyde, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm the Project Manager with the Canadian Institute for the Relief of Pain and Disability, or CIRPD. And this webinar is co-sponsored by CIRPD ourselves and Pain BC in collaboration with the Canadian Pain Coalition. It's also made possible through the support of the Community Gaming Grant Program through the BC government. And our presenter today is Dr. Drew Sturgeon. Dr. Sturgeon is currently a postdoctoral pain psychology fellow in the Stanford University Pain Management Center and Stanford Systems Neuroscience and Pain Laboratory. He has published articles in the areas of psychological interventions for chronic pain, pain catastrophizing, and resilience in people with chronic pain. He remains active in the evaluation and treatment of chronic pain and has continued a line of research in the evaluation and promotion of resilience in chronic pain. And now I will hand it over to him for his presentation. So pain uh, teaches you when it occurs and you can learn to adjust your behavior around that. So it's important here to acknowledge the, the distinction between acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain is pain that we generally think of as being useful. Uh, pain that refers to s tissue damage. If there's a new injury, a new medical problem that emerges, pain may accompany that. And it's important to know that you should adjust your behavior accordingly, whether this is to seek medical treatment or if you break your leg, for example, staying off of it. Uh, chronic pain, which is what we often see in treatment settings, uh, at least in psychology, uh, is pain that has sort of lost its ability to tell you anything useful. Um, it's no longer telling you necessarily that there is new tissue damage occurring uh, or that there's anything dangerous or threatening going on. It's pain that quite simply just hurts. Um, it's important to revisit this idea of a teaching signal because although pain is useful in helping you avoid future injury when it's acute, uh, it can teach you uh, potentially harmful habits uh, in its chronic form. So briefly, we're going to discuss the, the gate control theory of pain. This was uh, uh, initially coined by uh, Robert Melzek and P.D. Wall um, in the 1960s. Uh, they, create, they, they drew the distinction between uh, nociception and pain. So nociception is the signal that occurs in the peripheral nervous system in your, in your arms and legs uh, that reflects tissue damage. Uh, this is a signal that's transmitted from the, uh, the peripheral nervous system up through the spinal cord and into the brain. It's important to understand that pain doesn't become pain until it hits the brain. Uh, and the pain itself, the way that we refer to it, is actually the experience that, uh, is, that is undergone by the pain sufferer and is not the same thing as nociception. Now, uh, Melzack and Wall talked about the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, which is in essence just a bundle of nerves in the base of the spine that they felt acted like a, a gating mechanism. So the idea being that if the, the gate was open more, more pain signal would go to the brain, and if the gate were closed, less pain signal could get to the brain. The takeaway message was in essence that pain, the, the signal of pain, the experience of pain can be modified. And the examples that I would offer here are things like pain medications, that if you are coming out of surgery and they give you a pain medication, the, the damage that, you're, that your body has sustained post-surgically uh, has not changed, but your experience of pain itself has. Uh, the other example I like to use is for anyone who's ever had a, a blood draw or an injection. Uh, they often, uh, if you're like me, grew up maybe afraid of needles, the recommendation was uh, don't look at the needle. Whether or not you're paying attention to the area where there's pain can change the experience of pain itself. Uh, and one, one final point, what we know um, that's been built on since Melzack and Wall published these studies in the 60s was that it's not just the, the dorsal horn that's important in modifying the pain signal. It turns out that the signals that are coming from the nervous system to the brain, as well as signals coming from the brain down to the nervous system, can modify experience of pain. So the brain and the body are constantly communicating and uh, modifying the experience of pain. This helps explain why these sorts of principles still apply for people who have pain that is not in their arms or legs or back, but also works for things like uh, headaches. So uh, briefly, we'll talk about catastrophizing. Now, we define catastrophizing, which was initially a, uh, a construct that was created by uh, psychologists uh, in, in other fields, such as uh, 
in the field of depression or anxiety, to refer to a, a cognitive or emotional overreaction to some event. In the case of pain catastrophizing, we define it as this sort of an overreaction to uh, pain, either pain that is going on currently or pain that is expected to happen in the future. Uh, this is an important thing to understand as uh, a lot of what we see in pain psychology is that uh, catastrophizing occurs even when pain has not flared. Now, we define catastrophizing as in sort of three ways. Uh, it's a tendency towards magnifying the negative aspects of pain, so thoughts like uh, my pain has ruined my life, that there's nothing that I can do uh, because of my pain. Uh, it's also an inability to stop thinking about pain. So when my pain is high, it's all I can think about. I can't focus on anything else. Uh, and broadly, uh, a feeling of uh, helplessness in dealing with your pain in an effective way. So my pain is bad, it's always going to be bad, and there's nothing that I can do about it. So uh, the first question that I often get from patients is, you know, why do we care about catastrophizing? What we know is that the construct of catastrophizing, this tendency to overreact to pain in some way, uh, increases vulnerabilities in a variety of areas. So we know that for people who catastrophize about their pain more often, uh, they are more likely to uh, face significant depression or anxiety. Uh, at the daily level, we also know that they're more likely to be frustrated or angry or to experience more intense negative emotions. Uh, we also know that they tend to report lower levels of happiness. Uh, they tend to report lower quality of life overall. Uh, and that they also tend to rate their overall physical health uh, in, a, uh, in a worse way. We know that catastrophizing and sleep are related. And uh, this is uh, likely a mutually influential relationship, but we certainly know that people who catastrophize have more difficulty maintaining and getting good sleep. Um, we know that catastrophizing uh, leads to uh, social problems, that people who catastrophize more are more prone to uh, social conflict and to having poorer relationships with, uh, with people that are in their lives. Uh, catastrophizing, especially in the context of this sort of helplessness, uh, towards coping with pain uh, also makes people more likely to uh, engage in unhealthy behaviors that we know tend to be problematic in the long term when you have a chronic pain condition, things such as overusing pain medications or avoiding healthy behaviors like exercise. Uh, there is a, a, an increasingly large area of literature that suggests that people who catastrophize are also at, poor, at higher risk of having poor responses to medical treatment such as surgery. Um, this has been studied in a variety of interventions, uh, primarily things like knee surgeries, but also uh, surgeries such as breast cancer, uh, back pain treatment, and abdominal hysterectomy. So when you catastrophize more often, what seems to be happening is that the, the body is uh, sort of at a more stressed state, which can uh, affect uh, a physical ability to tolerate and recover from uh, intense medical treatment. We know that people who catastrophize are more likely to have higher levels of physical disability. They're also less likely to be working. Uh, and we know that people who catastrophize more also tend to report higher levels of pain intensity itself. Now, uh, as I'll talk about in a little while, this is something that we know tends to occur kind of in both directions. We know that uh, when people experience more pain, they are more likely to catastrophize. But at the same time, there's also some evidence that when people are catastrophizing, what seems to be happening is that they are enhancing the pain, that nociceptive signal being uh, transmitted to the brain. So catastrophizing can actually increase the experience of pain. Um, this is an important idea as we, we often talk about the sort of vicious cycle of catastrophizing and pain, that pain gets worse, your catastrophizing gets worse, and that then in turn feeds back into your pain. Uh, it's important to know that when we talk about catastrophizing, traditionally we've talked about how catastrophizing has occurred within the person. So you worry about or you catastrophize about your own pain. But we also know uh, that catastrophizing can occur from others in your life. We see this often in parents of children with chronic pain, that catastrophizing that occurs both in the child and the parent has uh, uh, implications for how uh, both the child and the parent are dealing with the pain condition. Uh, similarly, we know that uh, spouses of people with chronic pain, uh, the extent to which they catastrophize certainly affects the quality of their relationship and affects the, the mood and functioning of, of uh, both people in the marriage. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important to know that uh, catastrophizing is more common when pain is higher, but also that, as I said before, catastrophizing does tend to increase pain as well. And what I'd like to emphasize here is that, to some extent, catastrophizing about pain is a normal process. And what I mean by that is that while there are differences between people, we know that some people have a stronger tendency to catastrophize, not just about pain, but about a variety of things, uh, but also that there are situational factors, that there are medical factors, there are a variety of factors that can increase or decrease your uh, tendency to catastrophize. Uh, the, ex uh, the extent to which you're in a situation where you feel threatened or supported can very much change the, the tendency to catastrophize about pain or about anything, really. The takeaway message here uh, is that while catastrophizing is normative uh, to the extent that if pain gets bad enough, if stress gets bad enough, if, if the situation is uh, severe enough that most people can be prone to catastrophizing at some point or another, but that it is almost invariably an unhelpful process. Uh, the next piece to talk about is uh, how we treat catastrophizing. We know uh, there have been a variety of uh, uh, interventions, and we'll go through these one by one. But um, the 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 best evidence for uh, psychological treatments for catastrophizing and for chronic pain in general are, are currently listed on the screen. Uh, these involve things like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, newer therapies such as mindfulness-based stress reduction and acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, as well as more uh, behaviorally based approaches such as graded in vivo exposure. Um, it's also important to know that traditionally these are treatments that have been done in one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, although in the cases of MBSR and ACT, uh, these do occur often in a group or class setting. Uh, it's also important, uh, in, in recent years, there's also been a movement towards seeing if we can translate these treatments to uh, an Internet-based intervention. So uh, to date, I don't know that there's anything that's been broadly disseminated yet, but this is a focus uh, as far as making sure that there's broader access to these services in the future. So first, we'll talk about what we, what we often consider to be the gold standard of uh, psychological interventions for pain. Uh, and this is cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, it's important to know that cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, uh, is something that was not initially developed for pain, but has been uh, used in a variety of other disorders, such as depression, and anxiety, and eating disorders, uh, but has also uh, been translated to uh, helping people adapt more effectively uh, to their pain. Uh, from the standpoint of treating catastrophizing, uh, the focus in CBT is on identifying when people are having unrealistic, distorted, or unhelpful thoughts about their pain, so when they're more likely to catastrophize. Um, in, in the course of treatment, we talk about how these thoughts may be harmful to certainly your mood, make you more fearful or anxious or angry, uh, but may, and also may affect your behavior where you are more likely to avoid things that might otherwise be healthy or important, such as exercising or going to work, uh, but also can, can increase the experience of pain. Uh, the final step, after we've sort of identified when these thoughts are distorted or unhelpful and how they're affecting the person, is uh, finding ways to uh, reinterpret or restructure these thoughts so that we find ways to have the experience of pain feel less damaging. I'd like to emphasize here this is kind of a mechanistic approach. We actually identify specific, discrete thoughts, how they make you feel, and then identify to what extent we believe these things, to what extent we feel that they're accurate, and then finding alternative ways to interpret them. Uh, CBT for pain is not strictly a cognitive approach. Uh, we, it's also taught in conjunction with other skills that we know are important for uh, functioning in pain management, such as behavioral relaxation, so diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, uh, activity pacing with, a, with an approach uh, towards uh, finding ways to be more physically active while reducing the likelihood of causing pain flares that may uh, knock somebody with pain out of commission for a period of time, uh, and, and principles for sleep improvement. Uh, what I've got here is a, uh, a form that you can uh, access online through psychologytools.org. It's an, it's an excellent website for therapists, but uh, the reason I include this here is to give you sort of a sense of what it looks like when, uh, when we go through a cognitive restructuring approach. So from left to right, we, we, 
we can see sort of what the situation was uh, that may have prompted a negative thought, uh, what emotions or feelings occurred at that time, and what sort of negative thought came up uh, initially. So waking up in the morning thinking, my pain is worse than it's ever been, there's nothing I can do to help. Uh, finding evidence that both supports and does not support the thought, uh, leading sort of uh, mentally to this idea that you can uh, find an alternative way to interpret it, and then once we found an alternative uh, and healthier and, and less distressing thought, uh, how this changes the emotion or feeling. Uh, the next uh, intervention that we'll discuss is mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, this is one of the uh, so-called third wave uh, therapies for chronic pain. Uh, this was uh, uh, initially created by John Kabat-Zinn, who's a psychologist uh, that worked within the uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, it was adopted actually using principles of Zen Buddhism, although it is important to note that this is not a religious practice, that it was in fact used in the service of treating chronic pain. Uh, the approach in MBSR is to cultivate a daily meditation practice uh, through which we can help improve responses to pain. Uh, the theory behind MBSR is that pain itself is an alarm signal. And when, this pain, when pain is more prominent, uh, it tends to increase the, the likelihood that we fall back into automatic responses that are often unhelpful. Things such as clenching or avoiding other healthy activities or uh, withdrawing from important social relationships. Uh, and what we know is though these, relation, uh, though these responses are automatic, uh, they often lead us in the wrong direction. So the focus in MBSR is to uh, develop a daily practice. In, in doing so, we hope to increase uh, a patient's ability to stay in the present, that even if pain comes up, uh, they are able to direct your attention and your focus accordingly so that you're making the best possible uh, and the most clear-headed decision about how to cope with your pain. Uh, it's important to know that this is a non-directive approach, um, that we don't necessarily tell people this is good, this is bad, but uh, allows them the freedom to uh, be present even in, in times of increased pain or stress and to make the choices that they feel are most helpful uh, f for the patient. We know that this can, incre uh, this can decrease uh, those unhealthy uh, reactions to pain and also break some of those automatic processes that can lead to increased pain or distress in the long term, such as catastrophizing or other unhealthy behaviors. Um, it's also been effective in things like treating uh, some emotional distress, uh, pain-related anxiety, some depression in people with chronic pain. Uh, and the principles of mindfulness have been applied to other, other treatments uh, and to other psychological disorders uh, such as depression and anxiety, um, though research in that area is still ongoing. Uh, the third intervention that we'll discuss today is uh, called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or ACT for short. Um, the focus in ACT, in, much, in a similar vein to MBSR, is that uh, the focus is not on changing thoughts themselves, as it's thought that thoughts themselves are not something that can be controlled. Uh, the focus is instead on maintaining a more flexible and present approach when thoughts do occur, and learning not to be avoidant or to turn away from them when they're distressing. So uh, in a similar way to MBSR, uh, ACT focuses on cultivating a non-judgmental approach to pain and distress, recognizing and accepting thoughts when they, when they occur, uh, and allowing uh, the person to stay focused and in the present. Uh, the other piece to ACT that has been, that has been discussed um, that is healthy in the longer term is identifying goals and values. So with an understanding that uh, when pain is high, the initial tendency is often to focus on getting pain relief immediately at, at any cost. Uh, but when the pain itself may not be controllable or may not be uh, avoidable, that uh, identifying personal values and helping people to direct their efforts towards acting in ways that are uh, more important to them personally uh, can help to improve uh, psychological well-being uh, and function in the long run. Uh, one more intervention to acknowledge here uh, is a largely behavioral approach to pain. Uh, it's what we call graded in vivo exposure. Uh, 
Now, it's important to understand that this, this intervention is largely, uh, has been largely studied in uh, back pain populations, though there is some evidence for other conditions that are musculoskeletal in nature, such as neck pain or shoulder pain. Uh, the focus is on addressing catastrophizing and fear of movement by uh, creating a hierarchy or a scale of physical movements. And, through uh, slow, safe, and gradually increasing exposure to movement, we can help decrease or extinguish that fear response. Uh, this is a treatment that's, uh, tra that's traditionally been conducted with a physical therapist, though this is often done in conjunction with mental health work, where the psychologist will help to uh, identify which aspects of movement or of pain are the most uh, fear-inducing and uh, across time through this behavioral exposure, catastrophizing and fear of pain will decrease, often with uh, an accompanying increase in physical function. So to summarize the psychological treatments for catastrophizing, uh, CBT for pain is what we've traditionally considered to be the gold standard for uh, interventions for chronic pain. Um, there are a multitude of studies across several decades suggesting that CBT for pain does work, that it improves function, it decreases disability, it decreases uh, distress related to pain, uh, and can, it can in some cases have even a small effect on pain itself. Um, but it's important to know that although the largest base of evidence is for CBT, the most recent evidence suggests that any of these uh, approaches can treat pain catastrophizing. Uh, to date, we have a variety of studies that su suggest that CBT and ACT and MBSR are all acting on similar mechanisms, things like catastrophizing. Uh, but what we don't yet know is which treatment works best for a given person when they walk into your office. Um, I would like to highlight here a, uh, a single session intervention uh, being created by one of my colleagues at Stanford University, Beth Darnell, is uh, currently running a single session class to treat pain catastrophizing called From Catastrophizing to Recovery. Uh, Dr. Darnell has published on this, uh, this intervention already, but is currently working on uh, a, a larger and more comprehensive study to determine uh, the effectiveness of this, uh, this intervention across time. Uh, and for uh, which people and in what ways that it, it can be effective. I, I'd like to emphasize this as an important idea for future, uh, in the future, as many patients, uh, many of whom we even will acknowledge that catastrophizing or psychological distress is a big part of their pain, will still say that due to time or money constraints that it's hard to go into treatment that may last six, eight, even 12 weeks. Uh, so single session interventions are, are or shorter interventions may be valuable uh, as far as improving adherence and access to these sorts of psychological services. The takeaway point uh, from this part of the, the webcast is to understand that there are multiple approaches to treating pain from a psychological standpoint. And it's also important to know that you don't have to have a psychiatric or psychological diagnosis to benefit from them. Uh, often the people that we see uh, in our pain clinic don't carry uh, a mood disorder diagnosis such as depression or anxiety. Uh, they're coming in just in service of helping to uh, find ways to cope more effectively and to improve their quality of life and their function in the long term. However, uh, catastrophizing the negative aspects of pain, I like to say, are only half the story. Uh, we know there's a multitude of evidence that pain has negative consequences. I tell the same joke in every talk that I give, and no one ever laughs, but I'll tell it again anyway, uh, which is about five, ten minutes into the talk, I'll ask, have I convinced you that pain is bad yet? Um, this is done with the understanding that most people understand that from the outset, and that there really isn't a whole lot of convincing that I need to do. Uh, it's important to know, though, that our traditional approach, both in treatment and research, has been to focus on the problems that pain has caused. And while that is absolutely an important piece, it's also important to understand that many people with pain uh, continue to function well even when their pain is high, and even if they don't do so initially, that across time they do learn to function well. Uh, we refer to this phenomenon as resilience. Uh, it's something that hasn't been studied uh, very much in the field of chronic pain up until the last five to ten years, but I think it's no less important understanding how people pain and is, in fact, perhaps as important, if not more so, than the problems that pain creates. 
So a brief primer uh, is in discussing resilience. This is a, a, con a concept that was initially studied in human development, uh, often in children coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, those who were abused or neglected or uh, came from severe financial uh, disadvantages, what they often saw was that while some of those children did end up uh, having a more difficult time later in life with legal problems, with mood problems, with substance abuse problems, uh, many of them, despite all of these stressors, continued to develop and function positively, even though the adversity looked to be largely the same. Uh, so this is an idea that we have co-opted in the idea of chronic pain, because when pain is chronic and it continues to occur, uh, for days or weeks or months or years, that uh, continued resilience uh, is not only an important thing to acknowledge, but it happens all the time. So we think of resilience, especially in the, uh, the field of chronic pain, as being comprised of stable characteristics, uh, things like personality factors, um, physical fitness, uh, but also psychological mechanisms, so thoughts, as we've discussed, as well as uh, emotions that can contribute to coping with pain more effectively. Uh, but also that resilience is something that changes depending on the context. We know that uh, a person's responses to pain will change depending on the social situation, depending on what the demands placed on them are, what, uh, who is there with them, and also what their goals are. So we describe pain resilience in sort of three ways. And I do this uh, thinking about it from sort of a time-based standpoint. Uh, pain resilience is comprised of sustainability, recovery, and growth. Sustainability, or immediate resilience, is uh, identifying in the moment when pain is potentially posing a problem to continued functioning in a positive way. So if you wake up in the morning and your pain is higher than it's ever been, deciding whether or not to go to work despite the fact that your pain is high, or uh, missing a day. Uh, it's important to understand, however, that sustainability takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort, and that you can't indefinitely persist in things that are painful with no, with no increased cost. So the next piece is what we call short-term resilience or recovery. Successful recovery occurs when uh, somebody is able to bounce back from a setback that pain may have caused. So if you do miss a day of work due to your pain, uh, does this set you on a downward spiral where you then miss two to three weeks, or are you able to get back to work the next day? Uh, and across time, what we, often, what we often look at is whether or not uh, there's any growth or long-term resilience. Now, I want to stop here and emphasize that when I talk to people with pain, they often tell me, well, I don't think about my pain as a good thing, and I, that's under, it's a very understandable reaction. And the point here is not that pain is inherently a good thing. I think most people would take issue with that. But rather that uh, with continued attempts at adjusting and coping uh, and living life with pain, that new learning and growth can occur. So uh, one example of this is learning how to pace yourself or how to cope effectively when your pain is high. The first time that your pain onsets, that may not be a skill that you've developed yet because it's never been an issue before. But across time, people actively look for ways to cope more effectively. It's also important to know that a lot of people who've had pain for, for years uh, at a time, that they are able to tell you, well, Though my pain isn't inherently a good thing, I have, I have been able to pull positive things out of it. I know now who in my life is the most supportive. I know what's most important for me to do, where, where I should spend my time and my focus and my energy. So this is uh, not a Pollyanna approach to, to pain, suggesting that it's a good thing, but rather that even in the context of something that is stressful or painful or disruptive, that positive things can still come out of it. So as I was saying, you know, my, my, my focus here is not to suggest that those negative or risk factors related to chronic pain aren't important, but that we should also acknowledge that there are positive facets that people bring to the table that can help them cope more effectively. It's also important to know that resilience in pain, as we talk about it, varies from person to person and from situation to situation. I often talk about resilience as being something that is domain-specific. Uh, you can be resilient in some ways and not others. Uh, if, for example, uh, your pain makes you feel depressed, 
but you're continuing to go to work, you're continuing to be supportive to your loved ones, uh, you may be resilient from the standpoint of your behavior or your function or your social function, but that your mood or your emotional resilience may not be as high as we'd like it to be yet. Um, so it's important to know that this is not an either-or proposition, that resilience is something that uh, is, is very subject to individual differences. It's also important to understand that the context of pain is important, that goals are important. The question that I often like to ask with my patients is, why is someone trying to function even though it hurts? Or are they doing that at all? We'll go over this in more detail a bit later. So, uh, there are a variety of constructs that we know can contribute to resilience in the area of chronic pain. We'll go, we'll go through each of these in some detail. The first is a concept that we call pain acceptance. And this has been defined in the literature as a process of acknowledging that you have pain that may or may not ever go away. Uh, stopping attempts to stop pain that may not be helpful and may end up being counterproductive. Uh, and ultimately learning to lead a richer life despite the presence of pain, whether or not pain occurs. Uh, people who are able to accept their pain more fully tend to show an increased willingness to experience pain, which means that when pain occurs, they're less likely to get depressed, angry, or anxious, uh, and they find ways to continue to do those things that are important in their daily lives. I want to emphasize here that when I talk about acceptance, this can often be a four-letter word for a lot of people dealing with pain. The idea behind acceptance of pain is not that you are resigning yourself to pain forever or that you are giving up any type of appropriate care. The focus is on maintaining a more flexible approach, that if, if your approach to managing your pain isn't helpful, uh, if you are attempting to control your pain by taking more medication than you're prescribed or avoiding exercise or not talking to people or not going to work, that those those things may not be overly effective in treating your pain, and they especially may not be effective in helping to get you where you want to go in life. So the, the approach transitions from controlling pain in any form to managing or coping with your pain more effectively. Uh, I like to think of this as freeing up energy that you might spend on activities that aren't pain related. Uh, I've yet to meet the patient who says, yeah, pain is the only thing in my life and that's how I want it. And as I said before, acceptance of pain does not mean that you avoid medical care. This is something that occurs concurrently, but we want to make sure that we're taking a balanced approach so that it's, the onus is not only on medical providers, that people, when they take an active approach in dealing with their pain, are able to function more effectively and they end up happier and healthier long term. Uh, we'll talk about goals now. And there are a variety of things that feed into goals. The, the place to start is with uh, ideas like optimism. We define optimism as a general tendency to find uh, or maintain a positive expectancy about the future. So continue to expect positive things even when things are stressful or uh, threatening. Now, optimism is important for a variety of reasons, but not the least of which is uh, it's been theorized that what optimism allows people to do when they're dealing with pain is to stay open to opportunities in their environment that help make li their lives better. So rather than letting your pain narrow your focus only to what can I do to get out of pain, maybe finding out that there are other opportunities in your life that might make you happier as a person. Uh, hope is, a, is an idea that is very closely related to optimism. It hasn't been studied quite as much, but uh, uh, carries a lot of the same, the same ideas. Uh, it's, we, we define it as an active belief that someone can pursue and achieve the goals that are important to them. So identifying where you want to go and how you want to get there. There's also some evidence that people who are able to state a strong purpose in life, what it is that, they're, that drives them to get up every day, uh, helps them to be less emotionally reactive to pain, that they're able to cope more effectively, and that across time, they're, they're a lot more likely to be resilient to their pain. From a clinical standpoint, what this often leads me to do is to focus on goals, especially functional goals. When I see patients, I like to know, okay, so even if, if we are able to get your, your pain under better control, what is this going to allow you to do? What those, for those people who are able to say, well, 
it's not just the fact that I have pain, it's the fact that it's keeping me from spending time with my loved ones, or my job is really important to me, and I'm not able to do that the way I'd like right now. Those are things that can help keep people moving, even if treatment for pain levels off, or we can't get you to 100% pain relief. I'd also like to emphasize here the distinction between pain tolerance and resilience. Pain tolerance is your ability to push through pain uh, for really any reason. I often tell people, you know, your tolerance may be high, but if you come in and tell me that you're putting your hand on the stove and leaving it there for prolonged periods, I'm going to ask you why. The goal is what makes somebody resilient. You are resilient if you are pursuing something that is otherwise important to you, despite the presence of pain. So the takeaway goal is there is no resilience if you don't have other goals in mind. Uh, another important topic here is uh, self-efficacy. This is, we define generally as a belief in uh, one's own ability to manage their pain and to continue to function in an effective way. We know that people who report higher levels of self-efficacy tend to report lower levels of pain intensity. They tend to be less likely to be disabled due to the level of pain that they do have. They're less likely to be depressed, and they tend to report healthier and more effective strategies for coping with their pain. Self-efficacy can be improved in a lot of ways, but one of the primary ways it's been uh, developed over the last few decades has been the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program by uh, Dr. Kate Lorig at Stanford. Uh, this program has been adopted for a variety of different medical conditions and pain conditions and has been spread throughout the world. Uh, a, a quick Google search will tell you just how prolific Dr. Lorig is. These are uh, very, very common and very low-cost interventions for people who are trying to improve their self-efficacy. Positive emotions are one of, if not the most important factors in resilience. So often when I talk to patients, there's the, the discussion of what, what do you mean by positive emotions? You know, my pain makes me unhappy. And that's, that's certainly fair. What we know from research, however, is that there are ways to continue to inspire positive emotions even when pain is chronic in nature. The benefits of positive emotions are, are getting increasingly fleshed out by the research. So I'll, I'll attempt to summarize them here, but understand that there are, uh, there's even a much broader uh, evidence base for how healthy positive emotions are than what I've listed here. Uh, positive emotions seem to have a broaden and build effect on someone's cognitive or uh, intellectual abilities. So when people are stressed, what we often know tends to happen is that you get tunnel vision. Your ability to focus or think flexibly decreases when you're dealing with significant stress or pain. Positive emotions can help you bounce back from negative emotions or stress and to help you think flexibly, especially in difficult situations. So they have cognitive effects. They help you bounce back from an emotional standpoint. They can help decrease negative moods. They can also weaken the relationship between pain and negative emotions themselves. People who are able to increase their positive emotions tend to show less of a negative emotional response when their pain is high. So they're less likely to say, my pain makes me angry. My pain has affected my social functioning. Uh, it also has a direct relationship with recovery from pain catastrophizing. So positive emotions are very important. And I want to emphasize here, there are a variety of ways to improve positive emotions, and that could be a talk in and of itself. But one of the primary ways that I'd like to emphasize is through the social world. We know that pain itself is social, for better or for worse. We often hear that pain is invisible, that people, even well-meaning people in the lives of, of people with chronic pain, don't necessarily understand what it's like to have a chronic pain condition. And this can lead to a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, and a lot of depression. Uh, but also, the social world can be a very fruitful place to improve positive emotions. We know that people who have stronger social support report higher levels of life satisfaction, and they're less reactive to painful situations. We see this in experimental settings and in daily life. They report less pain and less nervous system activation when something painful or stressful happens. It's also important to know that one of the primary sources of positive emotions that we have in daily life is from our social interactions. This is not to suggest that it's the only way, but it's, a, it's an important thing that is often glossed over in the context of chronic pain treatment. Social relationships is something that I invariably ask every patient that I see, because we, if we want people to feel happier and healthier in the long run, that's an important piece of it. So for the providers out there, if you're trying to find ways to discuss resilience, these are my recommendations. 
ask about what their goals are and what their values are. I want to draw the distinction here between goals and values. Goals are things that you can put on a list and check off when they're done. If my, my list of goals may include going to the grocery store today, it has a very obvious beginning and end. Values are things that are less tangible, things like being a good family member, being a good spouse, being a good person. These are things that you don't necessarily have a beginning and an end of, but when you have those things, it can help to direct efforts accordingly. How close are you to acting on your values? Uh, as we've talked about, catastrophizing and these sort of coping thoughts are things that ha make a big difference in how people cope with pain. So asking, what is it that people tell themselves when they're dealing with their pain? When their pain is higher, what are the thoughts that are running through their head? Uh, how are they functioning socially? For all the reasons that we've just talked about, the social world has a very big impact, and it's, it can be very much a double-edged sword. So if pain leads people to withdraw from important relationships, that's a risk factor. But if they're finding ways to continue to socialize, continuing to engage, and continuing to get support, this can be a very important source of strength. And what are the, po what are the sources of positive emotion in their lives? What makes them feel excited or interested or rewarded in their everyday lives? Because this is that goal piece. When when pain is high, the, narr the focus often narrows. We want to know what is it that's going to keep you going when your pain is high. And finally, the takeaway points for this, uh, for this talk are that resilience is not just an either or, an individual uh, characteristic. It is something that can be learned and often is learned across time. It doesn't mean that you do everything right the first time. In fact, I've yet to meet the person who has made every right decision in their lives, and this is especially true for pain. An important piece of resilience is not just coping well the first time, but also bouncing back and learning from setbacks or mistakes. This helps to improve coping significantly in the future. You can be resilient in some ways and not others, and, import, and it's important to know that context is important. If you don't care about the outcome, pushing blindly through pain is not an adaptive thing. So speaking about goals and values and the context in which this pain occurs makes a big difference. And it's important to know that resilience, like the experience of pain itself, includes both internal processes, things like thoughts and emotions, but also social aspects. How are, how are people with pain dealing with the people around them? And how are they getting feedback back about the pain itself? So that is the end of my talk. I think I've pretty much hit the 45-minute mark. And, uh, I'm ready for questions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Drew. That was a very good presentation. Very approachable and straightforward. Um, yeah, very good. Great. Uh, let's see. Um, I have a question. Someone's asking, has um, EMDR therapy been shown to be effective and helpful approach for treating pain catastrophizing? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. Now, EMDR is a, is a treatment that was initially designed for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was with the, uh, with the understanding that, you know, so there's pieces of rapid eye movement, those sorts of things. And I'm, I'm not an expert here, so I'll, I'll try not to go too far out of my depth, other than to say that the, what seems to be the active approach, the active component of treatment in EMDR is exposure. So dealing with those traumatic things that have happened can help decrease the emotional distress that, that occurs around them. So to my knowledge, this isn't something that has ever been specifically studied. Um, it may have an effect, and it, my, my suspicion would be, if there was a group of patients that it would work better for, it would likely be people with chronic pain and post-traumatic stress disorder. All right, very good. And um, someone's asking, and this is a, a little bit more, I don't know, you covered it a little bit, but tips for enhancing and increasing resilience, and maybe particularly around for people who can't necessarily afford or have time for seeing a professional about it? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a very, that's a very good question. So the things that I would emphasize would be on this, this previous slide here. You know, thinking about what are the things that you, you want to accomplish in your life? What's important to you? We often use the, uh, there's a, a form you can find online, like a values dartboard or a road map. So what are the things that are important in your lives? Is it that you're, you need to be a good, a good neighbor, a good friend, a good, you know, a good professional in some way? 
and identifying how close you are to those things. This is a very broad level recommendation. But that if when I treat patients, the things that I recommend to them, if we're trying to improve resilience, is to improve their relationships with the people around them. So find ways to do things that are fun or enjoyable or lead to more positive interactions with the people around them. And if, if social support itself is limited, find activities, things that are activating that get you moving and make you feel happier and healthier. So the, the quick, dirty answer to your question is do things that make you happy, do things that make you feel, that help improve your level of physical activity. And uh, th find ways to engage with others in your life in a positive or enjoyable way. Very good. Um, let's see. I've had, there's a couple of people who have asked um, about um, resources online um, for this. And instead of having you maybe go through some of them, um, would it be all right if I just emailed you after the session for any pertinent online resources that you regularly refer people to? And then we can list those on our website? Absolutely. Wonderful. Then we'll do that. And I'll also, um, for those of you online, I will also um, add links to some of the CIRPD webinars that we've done on several of the topics that he touched on today in the, in the presentation. So I'll include links for those as well. Um, let's see. Is there a way to measure resilience or to point us to the construct which needs more work? Hmm. It's a good question. So um, I'm actually currently developing a questionnaire for resilience in chronic pain. Um, uh, it's been a little bit slow. We are. We will one of these days get get the thing published. There are currently uh, questionnaires out there for resilience. Um, more broadly, um, uh, there's an adult resilience scale, a resilience scale for adults, a brief resilience scale, some of which are proprietary and so you it would require purchase, um, but others such as the brief resilience scale, which is I think just six questions about how you deal with stress and how you recover, uh, can be a good one. Now, in the context of medical care, nothing that I know specifically. Uh, I will put in a plug for a, a questionnaire that I believe is, is free, um, and it, it touches on a bit of what we talked about earlier, which was uh, the chronic pain acceptance questionnaire. This was created by Lance McCracken, who's an excellent researcher in the area of uh, acceptance commitment therapy or contextual uh, CBT for pain. Uh, it's a, I think there's a short form, an eight item version, and also a 20 item version where you can ask these questions to get a sense of how people, how resilient people are in the context of their pain condition. So that may be something that you can find through Google. Um, there was a second part of the question, but I'm not remembering it. Um, uh, it was, oh, whether there was also um, maybe uh, a way to also um, hone in for people to be able to hone in on what still needs work within their, you know, ways of being resilient? Hmm. Um, you know, that's a good question. I, uh, I don't know of anything offhand. Um, I think that it's, it's, it can be important to think uh, broadly of, you know, what happens when pain is high, looking at uh, broad level function. So as an example, when I see patients in our pain clinic, I focus not just on the history of pain, what the severity of pain is, that sort of a thing, but also what the relationships look like now. Uh, what their mood functioning is right now. And I ask specific questions about, you know, how do you cope when your pain is high? What's going through your head? What do you do? How do you, what are those effective things that you do that can help you adapt or cope with pain or stress? Um, if we're talking about this on an individual basis, those are the sorts of questions I think can help give a fuller picture. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that you can be resilient in some ways and not others. So I like to use the example of if somebody is continuing to go to work despite their pain being high, but no one else in their lives can stand them, that they're very difficult to be around otherwise, is that person resilient? Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you could say yes in some ways and not others. But thinking about what would be, what's the ideal function for someone? Uh, given their life circumstances. You know, we, we see some folks who are in their 70s or 80s, and, you know, for them, returning to work is not only not an active goal, it's not something that they would ever do anyway. So thinking about resilience in the context of what is it the person really wants to accomplish? So broad level function, and also, what are they telling you about what they want to do? Very good. Um, 
question about pain journaling and whether um, it's something that has been shown to affect mood positively, negatively, or neutrally. Yeah. Um, there is some evidence that uh, expressive writing about pain can have some emotional benefits. Um, from a practical standpoint, it, it, I think it's an individual difference. I think there are some people who respond really well to it, others where this may not be true as much. Um, when I talk about recording things about your pain, it's for a, it can be for a couple of reasons. One is if you're really not sure what makes your pain better or worse, writing it down, tracking it can help, uh, can help you get a better sense of, yeah, my pain does change, and, and I know the factors that can do that. From the standpoint of sort of expressive writing, when people feel like they're not able to discuss these things enough, when they feel like that this is, this is such an issue that no one is listening to them about, expressive writing may be a way to help let some of that out. Um, I think in a lot of cases the, the benefit to expressive writing, and again, I want to place the caveat here that I am not an expert in this area, but it, it's often the benefit is in expressing it in a way that is not harmful, that can feel safe. So for those people who feel like, you know, really no one is understanding my pain and no one really is attempting to, uh, it, that would be the sort of, that would be when I would recommend it. All right, very good. And then someone else is asking about, you mentioned uh, briefly the FCR that your colleague was developing mm -hmm. um, and wondering how people can get access to this once it's kind of been published or released or um, if it's, at a point where it already has been? They have published a, an initial study on the, the tolerability and feasibility of it. So in essence, we had a, uh, Dr. Darnell had a, a sample of I think about 70 to 75 people with chronic pain uh, that went through this class. That is actually in, a, uh, in, an, open, in an open access journal, so anyone can access the, the, the results of that. I think to this stage it hasn't been validated enough that I, I don't think Dr. Darnell has made that broadly available. But I think the focus is definitely on making sure that this is uh, implemented better. Um, as of right now, this is going to be a little bit of an unsatisfying answer. But I think we have to we have to wait and see. But across time, I think really contacting uh, Beth Darnell directly will be a, the way to see if, it, if there's a way to broaden that that intervention. All right. Um, let's see. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that goals and context is important for resilience. How do you motivate a client whose goal is to maintain financial benefits? Boy, that's a good question. That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a case like that, it can be it can be hard to do. Um, when I'm, you know, when I see patients who, I mean, it, to start with, finances are. You know, financial stress is a, a factor that can make just about any problem worse. So with, the appropriate, with that appropriate understanding, you know, when I see patients, my focus is on what can we help you do? What can we help you, how can we help you function in ways that are more meaningful for you? Now, I can't make somebody go back to work that doesn't want to go back to work, and trying to do so really only ends up alienating them. So from the standpoint of, of individual treatment, if, if somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm not sure I'm able to return to work right now, and that's not really what my focus is, then we find other measurable functional goals for them. So what about getting back to some, some type of activity that you've enjoyed before? Or how about finding ways to engage with people more, more positively? So when the financial uh, when there's a financial incentive not to do that, it's a much more complex question. Um, and as I said, I don't want to I don't want to lead you in the wrong direction, but in those cases, I listen to what the patient says. You know, at this point, if I'm not ready or willing to go back to work, well, I, I, I as a practitioner can't make you. Um, so we'll focus on improving your life in, in whatever ways you tell me are important. All right, and then there's another question that's somewhat, somewhat related to that of, can you discuss the utilization of these techniques within a workplace? Within a workplace, okay. Well, some of the techniques, for example, and I, I will uh, full disclosure here. I'm more of a. I, I've been trained uh, primarily in, cro in cognitive behavioral therapy for pain, uh, though I've had some exposure to the other modalities as well. So I, I'll speak specifically to that. A lot of the skills that we teach um, are things that are pretty broadly applicable and can be done in a variety of situations. So when we teach people stress management, um, learning to do diaphragmatic breathing, 
you can do that anywhere. I've had I've had patients who told me that they they've had good benefit doing that while while in meetings or interacting with people. And some of the skills are are especially relevant uh, in the case of, of chronic. Uh, in the case of a workplace setting. So when there's a, a breakdown in communication about pain-related limitations at a job, you know, we talk about how to communicate effectively. Um, so in those cases, that's really the, the best or most important time to do it. In the case of things like uh, of MBSR, it's a bit tougher in the sense that a lot of workplaces aren't necessarily going to want you to practice daily meditation while you're there. Um, but the idea is when you start to use these skills, uh, more regularly, that their benefits do generalize. So even if you're not spending time at work doing doing focused meditation, that you 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 become better able to direct your attention accordingly. So, you know, in in some cases where really the the, the employer has been motivated to help the, the employee function more effectively despite a pain condition, I've even told them in some cases, you know, let them know that this is what you're doing to help improve your function. In a lot of cases, you know, employers are okay with that. But again, it's a very case by case basis. Some case some some many people don't even want to divulge that that information to their employers and I respect that as well. All right. And then um what do you say or I guess there's been a couple of questions that are similar. What do you what do you as a clinician, how do you um how do you handle clients that um, are having a difficulty understanding or buying into the importance of posit these types of positive interactions and resilience and um, the social factors, things like that? Well, in some cases, and I, I often hear from, you know, the, I won't say often, but sometimes people come in and say, yeah, the social aspects aren't really what's most important to me. And, in the, you know, what I often bring it back to is that, yeah, pain isn't just bad because it hurts. It's also bad because it does other things to, it, it affects most areas of your life. It affects your relationships. It affects, it affects your sleep. It affects your ability to think and to focus and to, to do these, these other things that are important to you. So if they're having a hard time buying into the, the idea of positive emotions as an important piece, I, I emphasize that, you know, the evidence says that this is something that from a, from a, physiological perspective, that we can actually see that your body and brain cope with stress and pain more effectively when we're able to, to inspire more positive emotions. So they don't have to do it, but it, when I give the rationale that we're going to focus not just on addressing problems as they come up, but also to help your body feel healthier, you know, I, get, I usually get pretty good buy-in from that standpoint. And we leave, you know, as far as specific uh, tailoring of the treatments, you know, when, when people come in and say, you know, I'm not really interested in changing my relationships, I say, that's fine. Let's find another way to, to make you happier. Wonderful. I think that's a very good, very good approach of, you know, taking their, taking the ways that they are prepared to buy in, because you can usually build on that, I would imagine, over time. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the best goals are the ones that come from the person themselves. If I start giving out goals as a, as a therapist, it tends not to go very well. I can, I can see that. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> um, all right. I think I'm going to go ahead and close down. We do still have a handful of questions um, that we didn't get answered. So um, I'll either be in contact uh, with you, Drew, about some of those questions, or we'll also provide some resources that address some of those um, questions that didn't get answered during this session. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us, and thank you very much, uh, Drew, for your presentation. It was really fantastic, and we've gotten, there's been a lot of um, positive comments uh, in, in the question box um, about the presentation. People have found it very valuable. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It was a lot of fun. So thanks for having me on. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer any questions that are, that are remaining. Oh, wonderful. Right. And then uh, just for everyone online, immediately following the webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey. We'd greatly appreciate your input on this webinar, as well as any suggestions for future topics that you're interested in. And our next chronic pain webinar will be, uh, it's called Riding the Emotional Roller Coaster of Chronic Pain with Dr. West. Wesley Buke, and a link for registering that will be included in the follow-up email. And all of our webinars are created for public access and are supported by voluntary donations and memberships. And we are 
once again, very glad that all of you were able to join us today, and uh, we look forward to your further participation with us. Thank you, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.